Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to talk uh, with you about something very near and dear to my heart. I know many of you are anxious for our Lord to return. Uh, so am I. However, we have but one opportunity while we're here to bring glory and honor to the one who loved us so much that he died in our place so that we might live, not someday, but today. It is important. It will matter. And it should matter to us now. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your love and your grace and your mercy for the life that you have given us we are so aware of our limitations we love you we love the brethren we love your word we just ask that you would take and guide us lead us direct us take charge of this time filter out all of that which is error that which is foolish and and seal to our hearts that which is truth for it's in christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to put this chart here up on the screen. Uh, I made this last night. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the life that we all live. And I'm talking about every single Christian. Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am cru crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, and that is a present active indicative, in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, His faithfulness who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. This is the life that we all live. Now, this is not the life that we may all experience, but there is no other life than this. It has constantly been a mystery to me why Christianity as a whole in the main today doesn't seem to center their conversation around the realities that God presented us to describe the genuine Christian life. Our conversation seems to be more centered around ourselves and what we must do rather than what Christ has done. There is a life that we may know and experience, although it's true of us. Uh, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We've all been given God's grace. Uh, I believe we've been given grace and, uh, and, and faith, uh, every single one of us, uh, according to our need and it may be hard for some Christians, I think, and I think, I, I believe it is hard for some Christians to grasp the fact that we have all the faith that we need, we have all the grace that we need, because there are many times where that just does not appear to be the case. But God has not left us to our own devices. He's constantly working in our lives and that for a purpose, and he does and what he does, he does perfectly. Philippians 3:10 and 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain, and that is an aorist active subjunctive. Maybe I will attain it. Maybe I won't. Unto the out-resurrection from the dead. The word there, resurrection, is a unique term that's used only here. Of us walking as though we are alive from the dead. 
literally out from the dead, says the Greek. And that's by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. There's a word manifest. You don't hear that often uh, within Christian uh, circles. Uh, it's a word, uh, it's a scriptural term. Uh, it's fanaru is the word. It's, it's from the word phos or phos meaning light. Uh, properly, it means to illumine, to make manifest, to make visible. Uh, figuratively, it means to make plain, in open view, uh, to become apparent. That's the word manifest. Second Corinthians 4.10, we always carry around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. That's, that should, that's literally reads in the Greek, should be manifested. That's an aorist, subjunctive, passive voice. Uh, that's the singular body of us all, plural. That's corporately. We always carry around in our corporate body, not our single body, our, the corporate body of Christ, the death of Jesus, in order that the life of Jesus may also be revealed, maybe it will, maybe it won't, in our body. And, and there are uh, uh, gatherings of believers today and uh, all around the world who, uh, in which that is not the case. Second Corinthians 4.11, For we which live, that is to live, that is to experience God's gift of life, and the word is zoe, it's the quality of life, are always delivered. Always delivered. That means that's to deliver over with a sense of close personal involvement. And we cannot, we do not deliver ourselves unto death. Steve, I just need to crucify self. I just need to, I just need to crucify that old man. And I need to, I need to be dead to sin. I need to become dead to sin. Well, you are dead to sin. The, the Bible says you are. If you are God's, one of God's people, you have died to sin. You may not live as though you've died to sin, but you have died to sin. To deliver over. We have, the text says, we've been delivered. We are, it literally says, are always delivered. That's every one of us. Whether you realize this or not, you are constantly being delivered over to death for His sake. That's for His sake now, not ours. His sake, that the life also of Jesus might be, and again we have an aorist subjunctive passive, the subjunctive mood is the mood of uncertainty, that the life also of Jesus might be, may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That is this earthen vessel of us all. It's uh, plural. Right now, there's something happening in your life. We read about it in Romans 8, 36, as it is written, for thy sake we, who's the we? It's the body of Christ. Every single member. We are all killed all the day long. Steve, I don't feel like I'm being killed all the day, all the day long. The text says you are. Killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Doesn't say some Christians are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Doesn't say that. And then we have fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, uh, it's, you, it's, it's uh, always seen in the singular. It's never fruits of the Spirit. I've heard that phrase my, my whole Christian life. Fruits of the Spirit. It's not fruits, plural. It's fruit, singular. And there's a reason for that. 
Philippians 1.11, being filled, having been filled, that's a perfect tense. The perfect tense in the Greek, Greek says we have at, at some point in time, in past time, we've been filled with the effect that you now remain, that we now remain presently filled. That's basically what the perfect tense says. Being filled, having been filled, perfect tense, with the singular fruit, not fruits plural, of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. James 3.18, and the singular fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. John 15.5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Again, it's singular. For without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Again, it's singular. So shall ye be my disciples. Psalms 1, 3. If you want to go back to the Old Testament. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit. Bringeth forth his fruit. Singular. Again, singular. In his season. We're all familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. We see that in Galatians chapter 5, verses uh, 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 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, singular again, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, gentle, gentleness, self-control. Uh, I think I said gentleness twice. Against such things, there is no law. There's no law. Well, Steve, how do we walk in the Spirit? Well, it says against such things, there is no law. There's nothing required for you and I to do in order to walk in the Spirit. Well, Steve, here's how you walk in the Spirit. And they, they go down their list of things that you've got to do in order to walk in the Spirit. You won't find anything like that in all, the, all of Scripture. We are commanded to walk in the Spirit, but we're not told how. And for good reason. Because there's not, against such things, there is no law. I, I hope that many of you are, are at least coming to understand what that says. And it's never flute, uh, fruits, plural. Why? Why isn't it fruits, plural? Well, it's because it's of Him, not of us. It, it, it doesn't come through law. Against such things, there is no law. Now, there is all of, all of that which is related to trust, faith, belief, and our identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. I've always been fascinated by the terms sit, stand, walk, run, rest. I, you know, it's Seems like they're in progression, one after the other. It's like we go from one to the other. You know, we're sitting and then we're standing. So when we stand, we're no longer sitting. And so we're standing and then we go to walking. And so now that we're walking, we're no longer standing. And you can't do that with that. Uh, these terms, sit, stand, walk, run, rest, are all terms that Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, in the New Testament, employs these terms. And I find them fascinating. Uh, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is where you abide. That's where you, you are sitting. You've been co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. How often do we talk about that? How often do Christians talk about that? Standing, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1. How often do we talk about standing? We, we talk an awful lot about being entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then there's walking. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. A direct command to walk in the Spirit. 
and somehow Christians get have gotten the idea that just because God commands something, that it, it requires something on our part for us to do it. But we haven't gotten to the good part yet here. You have a sinless new man that can do nothing but that. In, in essence, that is what you do at times. You, you may not realize it, but it is true of every single Christian. Now we come to running. Well, wherefore, seeing we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. That is sin singular. That's the sin nature. That's what we set aside. It goes right along with Romans 6.11. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin, it's articulated, which doth so easily beset us. And the old man certainly does. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, which is where you sit as well. You are co-seated with Christ in the head. How can that be? What is there, three thrones? One for, the, one for the Father, one for Christ, one for you? No. You are in Christ, in Him, is the phrase Paul uses, and he uses that over and over and over and over again. And then we're looking at resting. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief, referring back to Israel, not trusting God in their wilderness. This is our wilderness. We can live, walk through that wilderness, not trusting God, or we can walk through it trusting God. And then there's abiding. I am the vine, you're the branches, the one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. So we abide in him abiding in Him. Most people don't abide in Him. Now you could argue that we all collectively as Christians, corporately, every Christian abides, the word means remain, remains in Him. That is true, we do. We all remain in Him. But we may not remain or abide in Him as far as our walk is concerned. What is true of us may not be true in our experience. And I think that despite the fact that I believe, as well as many others, that the Lord is coming soon, that's no reason for us not to be concerned about some of the terms that God employs and uses in regard to our relationship, our walk with Him. They must be important or He wouldn't have mentioned them. And we're still here. We can't love His appearing to the, to the extent or be anxious for His coming to the point to where that we throw all this aside and say, that doesn't matter. We're going home. It will matter. It matters now. It will matter later. It matters now for the sake of those who need to know and understand, who need that encouragement, who need that, that comfort. We're still growing. We're not going to stop growing until he, he returns. So there's Christ manifest. That's 2 Corinthians. Fruit of the Spirit. That's Galatians 5. The, there's the righteousness based on faith. Not our own righteousness. Our own filthy rags righteousness. There's the righteousness that's based on faith that, that we live by. That's Romans 4 and 5. And then there's reckoning, Romans 6. All of these terms God gave us through Paul's epistles. They are intended for the church. The church. What is the difference between Christ manifest, look at the chart, and the fruit of the Spirit? You know, where would our 
where would the personal relationship be, folks, if we were all on the same fixed level of spiritual growth or maturity? Where would the need for faith be or for reckoning? There is a life that we all live. I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Not I, but Christ. Okay? That doesn't say Christ manifest. They kind of sound similar. They sound alike. Christ manifest. Not I, but Christ, Steve. Got to be the same thing. I don't think it is. Not I, but Christ describes a, uh, a, a, rea a reality, a, a position, a, uh, uh, a, uh, a station. Uh, I don't know whether, what other terms to d use to describe it. Not I, but Christ is, is, is the method. It's the principle. It's the means. It's the, the, the method God has used uh, ever since the church began. It's always been not I, but Christ. But these terms describe realities that are not just, these aren't just all synonyms. The, the life which I now live, that's a present active indicative. I, the, the life which I now presently actively live, definitely live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in, in vain. God is so concerned. About, here's what the modern church today would, would try to convince you. Of. God is very concerned about righteousness. And that's true. I'm here to tell you that when we talk about the subject of righteousness on an, an experiential level, we're looking at a method by which that is attained, which is a lot different than the method which the world religious system based on human merit would have you believe is the method by which that's attained. We may or may not, folks, live by God's faithfulness. We may struggle and struggle and struggle trying to live by our own faithfulness. That's, that's a common misconception. We don't live by our own faith. We, we walk by faith, but that faith is our trust and dependence in the, in the God who loved himself, loved, loves, loved us so much that he gave himself for us that we might live in utter dependence upon him. The Philippians 3, 10 and 11 verse that I may know him to know, especially through personal experience, firsthand acquaintance, and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings. There's so much in that verse to unpack. I just, I don't have the time. The fellowship of His sufferings. We suffer for the sake of Christ. Being made conformable unto His death. Folks, it was through His death that He bore fruit. And that was us, you and me. It is through our death that we bear fruit unto God. The same principle is working. The, the same principle that worked in Him. The same principle works in our lives today. It's not a different principle. It's the same cross. The cross that we carry is the cross of Christ. Not a different cross. We were crucified with Him. There's not two crosses. One for Him, one for us. I'm, I'm carrying my cross, Steve. Yep. Not your cross. Being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain... That's uh, the mood of uncertainty unto the out-resurrection from the dead, to walk in newness of life, His life. Literally out from the dead. The fruit of the Spirit. Singular. 
Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Steve, how do we walk in the Spirit? Well, <clears throat> I, I am not going to, to respond back to that question and say, well, you just do it. Just do it. It says walk in the Spirit. So y'all just, you just walk in the Spirit. I mean, or I ask someone, well, how do we walk in the Spirit? And they say, well, Steve, we just walk in the Spirit. We just, well, Steve, we just do it. Try that sometime. <laughs> See how that works for you. Well, God said for us to do it, so we do it. How do you do it, folks? Please let that seep in deep. How do you walk in the Spirit? Don't tell me what if you can't tell me how. How do we do that? God commanded it, so it must be something that we can do. No, it says against such things there is no law. There's, some, there's a dynamic that's occurring here, folks, that is far beyond what we would typically think is going on. Why is it never fruits plural? Because it's of Him. Singular. He's a singular person. He's, it's not of us. Plural. It's, it's never fruits plural because it's of Him. Not of us. Our responsibility, folks, lies in how much we involve ourselves in the work that Christ has done. And what God expects our response should be regarding it. God commands His people live in utter dependence upon Him. It is what He desires the most of us. What the flesh does is, is it walks independent of Him. Depending upon itself, trusting in itself, relying heavily on itself. It's either priding itself or it's either condemning itself. You know, one or the other. No wonder God authored the phrase, not I, but Christ. You know, that totally removes us from the picture. The life that we live is not I. It's something other than. And yet the conversation among Christians today, for, for, among, within Christianity today, and, ha, and has been, it's been the conversation for long before you were ever born, has basically been just the opposite. It's not Christ, but I. Puzzles me. <laughs> I'm, I'm just being honest. It perplexes me how that Christians have moved so far away from the reality of, what, of everything that's going on here. Where that the whole emphasis is on ourselves, not on Him. And they call that Christianity. That is not Christianity. That's something else. No wonder the cross crucifies. We, we Christians typically look at that cross as that, well, that's what Jesus hung on. That's what He died on. That, that's the cross of Christ. It crucified Him. With the majority, I would say, not even realizing that when He died on that cross, we died on that cross with Him. We was buried with Him. We was raised with Him when He rose from the dead. Raised with Him. Raised. We, we, we walk, folks, on resurrection ground. Resurrection ground. Walk as though those, as those who have been raised from the dead. What we know we're, someday we're going to be raised from the dead. Everybody loves talking about the rapture, being caught up together with Him, uh, being raised from the dead, and Christ will be raised, and then those 
uh, who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. They love talking about that. Why don't they love talking about the fact that they have been crucified with Christ, they've been buried with Him, raised with Him to walk in newness of life now, right now, as if it mattered, as if it's going to make a difference, because it will make a difference. Our best efforts to live the Christian life in our own strength and wisdom is worthy of nothing but death, dearly beloved. No wonder it's called Christ Manifest. No wonder it's called the fruit of the Spirit, the singular fruit of the Spirit. No wonder it's called the life of faith, a life of joy and peace and spiritual rest. No wonder God calls you a saint. No wonder He told you that His seed abides in you and you cannot sin because you've been born of God. No wonder the text says, Paul says in Romans 7, it is not I who sins, but sin which dwells in me. A child of God who stands before Him as righteous as Jesus Christ Himself. As righteous as His Son. That is what I want Christians to know as long as I have breath to say it. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Join us on Sunday. We're studying through 2 Corinthians. Until then, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.